to applaud that everywhere that we can. Having said that, um, we are starting to see some worrying trends in, in some countries where we're seeing case numbers increase. Um, and the case numbers are increasing to levels like we saw in the spring. Now, there's numbers of reasons for that. Um, one is we're in a much better position to detect cases. So countries have worked very hard to set up active case finding, um, improve their testing capacity, and so we, we have a better ability to look for cases. Uh, and that should be applauded. Um, what is really worrying, I think, for, for us is that we're not only seeing an increase in the case numbers, but we're seeing an increase in the hospitalizations. We're seeing increases in ICU. And this is a number of countries that we're seeing this in across the Northern Hemisphere, um, particularly in certain parts of Europe, um, in Spain and in France, in the eastern part of Europe, in Georgia, Montenegro, Ukraine, um, in some states in the United States. Um, and what we worry about is the hospitalizations and in the ICU. Um, and this is, this is worrying because we're in mid-September um, and we haven't started the flu season yet. And so um, while many of the measures that are in place, which will be protective against preventing transmission for, for COVID, um, will be beneficial for flu, um, we, may, we haven't seen flu circulate yet. And so you can't distinguish between flu and COVID initially. You need a test to do so. So testing systems are really stressed right now, even though they've, they've improved, but um, they're going to be even further stressed. And health systems, which um, you know, have a certain number of beds and hospitalizations, those are also going to be stressed. So we really need everyone to do what they can to prevent, prevent themselves from getting infected. We are not in the same position we were in, in the beginning of this pandemic. We know so much more. We are much better prepared at case finding, clinical care, early detection, getting test results back quicker, although that we still need to, we still need to work on. Um, so we're not in the same position. And, and countries are much better prepared. People are much better prepared. They know what they need to do to prevent themselves from getting infected and passing it on to others. So I did want to just highlight some of these, some of these trends that we are seeing. Um, and to also highlight there's a lot that we can do to, to kind of reduce this transmission and, and save lives even now. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Simply put, um, we just don't want this virus to have the momentum it has now going into the winter. Uh, and to see the virus gaining momentum and gaining speed uh, is not good. Uh, but there's still a lot we can do. And, and there are a number of weeks in which we can really try to work to drive down transmission so we can get things to a point where our hospital systems won't become overwhelmed. Our, our biggest fear, obviously, right now is that if the number of cases rises, if hospitalizations continue to rise, and if influenza were to kick in at the same time, we could end up in a situation where our frontline doctors and nurses are again struggling to, uh, to treat the sick. Uh, but as Maria said, uh, those frontline doctors and nurses have really learned how to save more lives, uh, how, to, how to treat uh, disease in a much more effective way. But they can only do that if they're dealing with the limited number of patients that they can cope with. No doctor, no nurse can save a life if the emergency room is full of sick people uh, and if people are arriving in late and waiting to be cared for because there's such a long line. So we really want to make sure that we can maximise uh, people's survival rates and maximise, minimise their time in hospital by ensuring that the number of people presenting uh, to healthcare with a severe or moderate disease is as low as possible. The only way we can do that is drive down the overall number of cases. So uh, I think it's just, a, as you said, Maria, it's, it's a call to now be aware. Uh, this is in our hands to a certain extent, and we, we, can, we can do a lot. Yeah, and remember, we have a flu vaccine. So uh, mm -hmm. we have a flu vaccine, and so um, people should get their flu vaccine, and that will help. And it will really help because, mm -hmm. as we said, you won't be able to distinguish between COVID and flu and other circulating pathogens because they're, they, they present as respiratory illnesses. And people will start to have runny noses. And in many countries, schools are opening again as societies open up. And it will be difficult to distinguish. So um, the system is going to be stressed. But there's a lot that we can do. And we need to do it now. It, you know, the du director general has talked a lot about this window of opportunity. We have another one. Mm -hmm. um, and especially as we go into the autumn, we go into the winter season, we really need to use this time wisely. And again, I don't want to sound like countries aren't doing a lot because they are. We just really need to apply these tools in place, governments, communities, and people need to be empowered to know exactly what to do, and they can.
Mm-hmm. And what we saw, and remember if you look back to February, March and April, um, countries tried to do contact tracing, they tried to do track and trace, they tried to investigate clusters, but as the number of infections grew, the system became overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Now, over the summer period, many, many countries have seen that, that drop in cases, and countries have reached a point where they're able to more effectively do tests and tracing, get results back quicker, investigate clusters, prevent amplification events. But if the numbers start to grow too high, then our capacity to do that uh, sort of public health measure of testing and tracing becomes much more difficult, and you reach a point where it's impossible, and then we're back to where we were in March and April, and nobody wants to go back there, and neither should we have to go back there. Thank you very much. But our viewers are already asking questions. For those who are not sure how to write, to leave the question, please on Facebook and LinkedIn, you can leave it via comment section. If you're watching us on Twitter, please use the hashtag AskWHO. So one of the first questions that we received, you mentioned that uh, we have increasing number of cases and also people who are hospitalized. But our Facebook users are asking about mortality rate, mm-hmm. and our LinkedIn u- users are asking about survival rate. Mm-hmm. Great questions. You go ahead. Great questions. Um, yes, so this is really important. So as we mentioned before, we, we've learned a lot, and we know so much more now about how to care for patients. We're detecting patients quicker. Um, they're receiving care quicker. We know that oxygen support, respiratory support helps. It saves lives. We know that dexamethasone, when given to critically ill patients, severely ill patients and critically ill patients, can save lives. There's so much that we're doing, and, and that is bringing mortality rates down, and that's important. The other thing that we're seeing is a a shift in the age distribution of the cases um, being reported. And so what we're learning here is that as societies are opening up, as people are going about their daily lives, um, people that are infected, the average age of the person infected in many countries is going down. And this is to be expected because in the beginning of a pandemic, in the beginning of any epidemic, most surveillance is focused on severe patients because these are the patients that show up at healthcare, But as we learn more, as surveillance improves, as testing improves, you can identify people on the more mild end of the spectrum. Um, And so we do see a younger younger age group. But one of these worrying trends that I mentioned are the hospitalizations among younger people between 15 years old and 44 years old. We're seeing a slight increase in, in hospitalizations in some countries at that age group. That is incredibly worrying. Um, And so we do need to prevent those infections. So mortality is reducing because we know more. Um, And the other thing that I think we're seeing is we're seeing seeing amplification events that were happening in long-term living facilities. For example, this is a vulnerable population, usually over the age of 60, having underlying conditions. If the virus can enter a long-term living facility, it could have devastating effects. If we could prevent the virus uh, reaching vulnerable populations, we will reduce mortality, and that we are seeing across a number of countries. So there's a numbers, number of factors. But please remember, we don't know a lot about the long-term effects from COVID infection, from infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We are learning that people, even with mild disease, young people are having long-term effects. We're just beginning to really understand this. There's a lot of research in this area. We've reached out to patient groups, um, but we don't know the long-term effects fully. Um, And this is something that is really important because just a quote-unquote mild infection could actually have these long-term effects. And so we still need to prevent all infections from happening, regardless of if they develop from severe disease, severe and and death. But please, you know, a mild infection could last quite some time. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe when we look at these tracking numbers we use, the number of confirmed cases and the number of deaths, and when you actually look at that, you know, it's still about two out of... uh, uh, two out of a hundred uh, confirmed cases, a lot of uh, die, and that's just just in reported cases. So it's still a significantly um, uh, dangerous disease, and that's across all age groups. And yet, and those death rates are much higher on older people, much higher on people underlying vulnerable conditions. This is still a vicious virus. Mm-hmm. Uh, to a point, we're saved in terms of the number of deaths per day of 5,000 has dropped from the, the peak, but uh, it's still we're losing 5,000 people a day on the planet from confirmed COVID death. 
that doesn't count those who may die because they were never tested. It may not count all the other causes of death because health services are interrupted. So this virus is still taking a very, very strong toll. And as Maria said, we don't know what the long-term uh, health effects. This is an inflammatory disease as well as a viral disease. It, the virus invades cells and it causes an inflammatory response. Uh, the, the body reacts against that. And what we've seen are inflammatory responses in the cardiovascular system, in the neurologic system, and all over the body. And we do not simply know what the long-term impact is of that. And you've seen it on TV. Many of you will have seen it on TV. I saw a kid on yesterday with his dad on, on TV, and they were both suffering the after effects of COVID six months on. And it was really interesting to listen to the testimony of that young boy. It was really, really articulate. And he was just talking about how it impacted him and how he couldn't sleep and how it was painful to move. And uh, my heart went out to him and his dad. And it was really important that they spoke because that's their personal experience. Not everybody has a complete and immediate recovery from this virus, and we don't fully understand the long term. And that's not to scare people, uh, because at the end of the day, the vast majority of people appear to recover very, very well. But um, we also need to be aware uh, this is a systemic viral illness, and uh, you can't take it for granted. And we don't know everything. I mean, I think a lot of people look to us to have answers for everything, and we don't have the answers for everything. We're working very hard across our international networks and to get the studies done, but those will take some time. And I think it's important. We, we, we try really hard to share what we know, to share what we don't know, but really importantly, what we are doing as an organization with our partners to try to get answers to these questions. We are working hard with partners all over the world and with patient groups directly who we've reached out to, who've reached out to us to try to get these answers. Um, I see you wrote down the 0.6%. The one mm -hmm. of the things we, thank you for reminding me, mm -hmm. one of the things that we also look at is not just the number of deaths from the reported cases, but what is the estimated number of deaths from the infections? Mm -hmm. So some of these are, these are unrecognized cases. They could be measured by seroprevalence. That estimate is 0.6%. That may not sound like a lot, but if you think of a virus that has the potential to spread wild, widely, and we have measures in place to be able to prevent that, that's a pretty high number. And that 0.6%, that estimate of the infection fatality ratio, increases dramatically by age. So again, we just need to do what we can, everything that we can to, to protect ourselves, to protect our loved ones, um, while we try to open up safely. Yeah, and that number is like more than one in 200 people. And if you imagine, if we assume that this virus, if we don't, find a vaccine, and we don't continue suppressing the transmission of this virus, and if we assume that virus spreads to 60 or 70 percent of the population of the world, uh, that's one in 200, effectively one in 200 people on this planet. And uh, you've, if from that perspective, uh, think of your chances of winning the lottery. Uh, this is, they think of, you know, when you look at your, your chances of being involved in an accident, if you look at your, many of the life risks we face, this is a significant uh, issue. Uh, so therefore, when these numbers look small, like 2% or 0.6%, they sound very small until you calculate that up for all of us uh, and see what the impact that has and the, the extra impact that has on families. Because when someone is lost, there's a family and there's a community uh, and there's all of that around it. So we don't want, I mean, we're, we are pleased in many ways, I think, uh, as Maria said, many countries have really found a way mm -hmm. with their communities. They found a way to uh, sustainably, I won't say live with the virus because it's, it's difficult to live with a virus that, that, that kills your loved ones, but to find a way to, to, to control the virus enough so that it has a minimal impact on life and society. Um, and, and I think learning lessons from those countries, and it's not always a one-size-fits-all. Some countries have done a combination of things that's worked in the next country, does a slightly different combination. I think it's been about clarity, it's been about consistency. It's about it's been sticking at it. It's about being flexible to change and adapt when new information has come up. And I think communities that have worked well with governments to sustain a response. And again, it's a credit to communities out there. This is exhausting for everyone. We've all been living with this now for nearly nine months. Uh, it feels like 40 years. Uh, 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 and it isn't easy to think, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere of going into another winter season 
with this hanging over everybody, hanging over all our plans, all our dreams, the weddings and the bar mitzvahs and the the the, the holidays and, and education and going to college and everything is being disrupted. Everything we know and everything we we cherish about our lives and, and that isn't it just isn't easy. Uh, but it, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We, as I said, countries have found a way to, to control this disease, and we have the prospect, if we work hard enough, uh, to have a safe and effective vaccine. So I do think there's a lot of hope on the horizon, and people in communities around the world are demonstrating that there are ways to beat this virus, uh, and also demonstrating that we are prepared as a, a global community to address some of these really important issues to face as a society. I've said it here before. Uh, climate justice, social justice, access, the conditions of our most vulnerable people, migrants, and uh, all of these other things that we want. What are the values we want in our society? And I think there are so many heroes out there. Uh, I said it uh, about, we've said it about health workers, but look at the teachers. Uh, and, you know, we all, uh, we all love to hate school. <laughs> Um, but I, I said, <laughs> yeah, exactly, everyone loves school now. But the work the teachers and administrators have put in to get kids back to school, that wasn't easy. It's still not easy. And it's still not easy. And, there, and we need to do everything to keep our kids in school because the effort has been made to put them there. Uh, but we may, in the more general population, have to make sacrifices to keep the kids at school, to keep our older population protected. And those sacrifices may be offering up a little bit of our personal freedoms and not going to that nightclub, not attending that crowded event. And that's where I think we all have to examine uh, what we do, me, uh, uh, everyone. We all have to do it. This isn't about me preaching to somebody else. All of us, and every one of us, can reduce our chance of transmitting the virus. Then the risk goes down for everybody. And if we, you know, you know, so it's, uh, and, and, but we recognize how tough this is to sustain. We recognize it. Uh, but uh, nothing, you know, we as a global society, we can achieve great things when we work together. Uh, and we really, we can screw it up when we don't. So I think that's the, well, that's, that's, you know, that's what we face. We have the chance to succeed and we have a chance to fail. And we can. Uh, and to an extent, that is in our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we need to do everything possible. We do not want to see our wisest, oldest, most cherished citizens again face the prospects of dying, particularly in unprotected nursing homes uh, over this winter season in the Northern Hemisphere. Do we really need to have that as the next warning of this pandemic going the wrong way? Or, or do we want to end up in a situation where we have to close our schools because there's just too much disease in the community? These are not outcomes that we need to see this winter. And I do think we can redouble. I know we're going on about this, Alexis, but I think this is, the question is fantastic and, and the answer is complex. Uh, and it would be great to continue this. Comment. I'd love to hear from the listeners, you know, what, what, you know, help us. What's going to work? What's going to help us sustain this effort? And particularly from young people. Yeah. You know, we're seeing some incredible innovation and creativity in the voices you know, to help us go through this. We, we're an evidence-based organization, so we look at science, we look at studies and the guidance that we put out, but they also need to be practical. They need to be applied. Um, and we speak to everyone on the planet. You know, we talk to all countries, we talk to everyone everywhere, and the situation isn't the same everywhere. So applying something, even the schools, you know, the schools guidance that we've recently put out, how that is applied in different countries, in urban areas, rural areas, rich areas, poor areas, everything, north, south, east, west, is different. And we are seeing schools in particular be very creative about how they are opening up and how they have the physical distancing in place and the wearing of masks. And I've really seen the use of masks, particularly in children, quite joyful, you know, in that sense of playful, you know, washing of their hands and singing songs and, and parents, you know, getting directly engaged in this. And we have the Peppa Pig video, which I personally love, um, and Sesame Street involved and, you know, in, in making it quite playful. But the mask, for example, you know, seeing different colors and seeing it, um, be part of their identity, but please don't sh don't share your masks. Don't trade your masks. I should say, um, you know, there's wonderful ways in which in which young people, children, young adults can get engaged and and show us how to be social while being physically distant. You know, we call this physical distancing and not social distancing. It's about still maintaining, like we are here in this room, 
um, but being social with, with our loved ones and using technology and et cetera. Thank you very much. I think this was really great to give to all our viewers as well uh, hope and also invitation to, to participate in this response, also to be creative with solutions. You mentioned there were some creative products that we also released on, on teaching or educating people how to wash their hands or help them educate their children or a lot of creativity with masks. What I've seen as well, there are a lot of creative ways that artists, different type kind of artists using to educate people as well. Wear a mask, when to wear a mask, how to wash hands properly, etc. It's been really amazing to see different movements ar uh, around the world on this. That sense of community around exactly. each, of these, each of these different things. There are a lot, a lot of questions coming. Um, I want to uh, go quickly through some follow-up on trends. You mentioned uh, Northern Hemisphere and we're seeing some increasing uh, trends. So some of our viewers on Facebook and Twitter are asking what are the trends uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and do we have any evidence that cases in Southern Hemisphere went up because it was, it was colder weather there? Um, do we have any data on that? Maybe I can start on this one. We have absolutely no data to suggest yet that this disease is particularly affected by the seasons as such, uh, other than maybe uh, where we see crowd people gathering together because of the season. But the actual ambient temperature does not seem to affect the behaviour of the virus. In terms of the Southern Hemisphere, over the last few months, certainly in South America has been badly hit. Uh, it's suffered greatly in this. South Africa is just coming through quite a difficult time uh, emerging from that. Uh, and as we, you've seen, uh, Australia has uh, had a, a small epidemic, but it's obviously been very tough for, for people in Australia because they were on top of this and they had to really go back to the... Uh, back to the drawing board and really make a double effort like we've seen in Japan and other places. And many countries have had to make a double effort. Mm. You know, and that's what we do in life. Sometimes you try and you do a third of the job or half the job and then you've got to pick yourself up and go back and finish the job. And that's not something unusual. And that's very hard. Double effort is hard. Triple effort is hard. It's very hard to... Uh, uh, Mandela, Nelson Mandela, one of my favourite quotes from him is... He, he said... Uh, uh, she said, I, I can't remember exactly, he said, do not do not uh, praise me for, um, uh, um, uh, do not judge me, he said, for the number of times I fall down. Judge me by the number of times I pick myself up back up again. Uh, I can't, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm not quoting it directly, but I, I think that's, that's a tough thing now. And I think there are countries uh, where, you know, they've had to react a number of times. Look at Korea, look at Japan, look at Australia. They've had to come back when things look good and then things don't look so good and then they've got to make another effort and, and that takes you know, and sometimes there's criticism, why is this happening and it's really hard sometimes to, that's even harder I think to do uh, in, in many cases. We are seeing a stabilization of the disease in South America, though the numbers are still quite high. Um, uh, in Africa in general, a, a stable pattern, Africa has done well and, and while the testing hasn't been as extensive as it is in other continents. Uh, we, we haven't seen those huge impacts uh, in, in Africa, although South Africa, as I said, has had a, a dangerous uh, outbreak. Um, uh, but there's also the way this disease impacts people is not just through COVID itself, but through disruption of other health services. So immunization rates are dropping, availability of maternal health services and safe deliveries from others are dropping because the health system itself has come under pressure. So we are seeing those effects. Uh, in Asia, uh, in general, and much of Asia is split. There's a north-south in Asia too, so we don't go north and south and then go to Asia. Asia has a distinct north and a distinct south. Uh, there are many countries in, in northern Asia. We are entering their winter, and they're very much along that corridor. And then there are obviously some of the countries uh, like uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the tropics, and they'll experience... Um, they're still experiencing uh, disease, uh, but they seem to be keeping the disease under uh, kind of a a level of control. Uh, but we've seen that in other countries. We've seen countries do well for a number of months and then things uh, get out of control. So we're not forgetting the Southern Hemisphere, please. Uh, don't. Uh, uh, the positive thing, I think, overall, is that the influenza season in the Southern Hemisphere has been very small. It doesn't mean it won't come eventually. It may offer some hope in the North, but there are differences in 
the level of um, physical distancing that was going on as the virus emerged. So that, that doesn't guarantee Europe or North America or North Asia that that won't that influenza will be mild. There is absolutely no guarantee. We hope that the influenza season in the Northern Hemisphere is um, reduced because that will reduce the pressure on the system. I have said before, uh, when you have a, uh, from the perspective of, of an older person or a very, very young child, uh, seasonal influenza can be a deadly virus. So two deadly viruses, COVID-19 and influenza. And as Maria said, we encourage particularly people with underlying conditions and, and people who are older to get vaccinated against flu. This is a virus for which we have a vaccine. Uh, and most countries have very, very positive policies towards free vaccination and, uh, and subsidized vaccination for influenza. So please, if it's available, get your flu vaccine. Can I say one other thing mm -hmm. about the Southern So one of the things that we're learning from them, and Mike has described the situation very, very well across the world, countries that are um, showing us this way, you know, many countries have had to put in these extreme so-called lockdown measures, and they needed to do that because they needed some time to take the pressure off the system, to get their testing and tracing up and running, and to give the health system time to free some of those beds. What we're seeing now in this second effort, you know, in this in this way of when we see a resurgence and we they, where they are uh, taking measures to bring these outbreaks under control, they're not needing to do these national lockdowns. What we are seeing is they're using the data that they are collecting from their surveillance systems and from all of the dis different systems that they have in place to apply these measures locally. And they're, it's a local response. And this is what we've been saying for months is that what we would like to see is a localized, a clear national plan, good systems in place, but l implementation at the most local level. So apply those as aggressively as needed in the smallest geographic range as you can to have the minimal impact on other systems and for a time limited, you know, for, for a certain amount of time that you need and then lift them again. Um, but that's hard to do because from a public point of view, it's just, well, yesterday you said this and then today you said this and then it's confusing. What do you want? Well, in a situation like this, it's evolving. Not only are we learning more about the science, and Alex, I get the question a lot of, it's like, when is the science going to be done? Can you please just be done and just give us an answer and just stop already? But that's not how science works. It's a process. But even the response is a process. It's how we are learning and it's how we're applying. So we're learning a lot from the Southern Hemisphere, from the tropics. Um, but as Mike has said, we don't have any indication that there is a seasonality to this yet. Um, but we do know that as there are colder months, and actually even in hotter situations, people go indoors to have air conditioning. If you are crowded inside, if you are in closed spaces, if the virus is around, if there's pulse, if you're not doing physical distancing, if you're not doing your hand hygiene, the virus will spread. So it's really important that we do avoid these three C's that we talk about, mm -hmm. the crowded spaces and closed settings and close contact settings. Um, make sure that we make good choices about the places that we go and we look at if there's windows that are open. That's a simple thing that can be done, um, you know, where the windows can be open. All of these things matter, and they all add. They all add up, um, and, and they're preventing transmission from happening. I'm glad you both mentioned as well uh, flu and coronavirus again, uh, COVID-19 uh, together, because several questions we received from different platforms from our viewers. Is there a chance that these two viruses can merge and we have some super scary new virus um, in following months? <laughs> no. No. In terms of the virus, the, the, the genetic makeup of the viruses themselves, no. Make a good Marvel movie. I was thinking of a, yeah, I think a that would mean, I'm sure someone is working on a script right now about that. <laughs> what we can see, though, is that it's possible for people to be infected with both. So there are people that are looking to see, can I be infected with SARS-CoV-2 and influenza? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. Um, we're trying to look at how often that happens. And as, as Mike has said, and in the Southern Hemisphere, we didn't really have a flu season because of all the measures that were in place. Um, and the measures that are working for COVID-19 will also be beneficial for flu. Plus, we have a flu vaccine. So we do need to prevent those, those flu infections from happening as well as COVID infections. It's going to be very complicated from a medical point of view for somebody showing up to say, what do I have? Do I have flu? Do I have COVID? Do I have RSV? Do I have something else? Uh, the common cold? Um, you won't be able to distinguish that immediately. That's why testing is, is really quite important. 
Um, but again, there are treatments, you know, there are vaccines for flu and there are treatments for flu. And now we have some positive results for, for COVID, but we really just want to prevent people from needing, from developing severe disease and really needing to, needing access to that care. Yeah, and the things that stop you getting COVID will stop you getting flu. Exactly. <laughs> so we don't have to add anything and get vaccinated against influenza if you're in a risk group uh, uh, and try and avoid that infection. Remember, both viruses put the respiratory system under significant pressure. They can put other systems, certainly COVID in this case, cause a systemic illness, influenza. Anyone who's really ever had influenza, because people often say they come back to work or school and say, oh, I had the flu last week. Uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know when you've had real flu. And that's what many people have said with COVID. Uh, it's the same thing. Think, oh my God, COVID was like, been, someone said, well, it was like someone hit me with a sledgehammer, you know? So this is not, uh, so when, it, the one thing I would not like, to, much or not as I wouldn't like to have either disease, I certainly wouldn't like to have the two of them at the same time in terms of the pressures that puts on the on your immune system, on your cardiovascular system, on your respiratory system. So we should avoid both uh, if at all possible, but there's no uh, no chance they'll they'll merge together into a new virus that's uh, for sure but i mean it's a good question in the sense it's not it's not a silly question no, no, no. not at all no, no. because we do have that phenomenon with influenza viruses and one of the the uh, greatest one of the ways in which pandemic influenza viruses actually emerge because very often uh, i won't bore people now but i think it's worth explaining that uh, flu viruses evolved through what we call antigenic drift if effectively the genes drift they, they move slowly they change slowly that's what it means it drifts mm -hmm. uh, over time and that's what we see every season and that's why we have to change the flu vaccine every year it drifts a little bit away from what it was before so we change the vaccine to get ahead of the virus and then we change the vaccine but every so often there is what we call an antigenic shift and it's a bit like a small earthquake versus a big earthquake every so often the earth moves and then every so often with influenza, we get this big antigenic shift, a huge shift in the genetic makeup, which makes the vaccines ineffective, which means the virus can spread in a pandemic fashion. The reason why that can happen is you may have a pig that lives somewhere in the rural area is infected by a human virus and a pig virus or a, a, a bird virus. And it is the act of being infected with one, two or three viruses at the same time that a brand new virus emerges because flu viruses are very good at exchanging packages of genetic material. They're almost like playing cards. Uh, it's almost like poker. Uh, and they play that sort of viral poker and what can come out the other end is a new virus. And that's why we're always so worried about pandemics of influenza because we never know when it's going to happen. It's like, again, as I said earlier, it's like winning the lottery. You do not know um, how, many times you, how many times you play the game uh, that you're going to get a new virus. So the, the, the question as asked is actually quite a smart question. Uh, it's just that in this case, these two very different family of viruses don't interact in that way. In that way. But we should tell people, we should tell the viewers that, there, that WHO has a system where we work uh, with labs all over the world to monitor these types of viruses. Mm -hmm. So there is a robust system that is in place to look. And we call this our, it's our, it's our, our global influenza program. And we leverage what we call GISRIS and our national influenza centers that are tracking these viruses over time. So there is a 70 years the system has been in place to look at the different viruses and look at the genetic makeup of them to see how much are they changing. And the last pandemic we had, I'm sure everybody remembers, was in 2009 which is exactly what happened. There was a mic, there was a new virus that emerged, a new subtype that emerged, and that one emerged from North America. Um, so we never know when, we never know where, but we know it will happen at some point. But there are systems that are in place to, to, to look for this and to detect for this and to develop vaccines. And so mm. I don't want the viewers to be scared that, mm. you know, this is something that we are tracking and we have tremendous partners all over the world through our, through our GISRA system. Um, who are helping us to do that. And in fact, uh, this week, I believe they're having the next discussion about the vaccine composition. Um, and so they will say, okay, and they look, they actually track all the viruses that are circulating all over to make an educated guess about what it will look like in, in six months' time for that's the next for the vaccine. Hemisphere. So for the southern always, hemisphere. So we're, we're always we're, six months ahead. That's right. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're having what will be the vaccine for the southern hemisphere winter season. 
next year. Mm -hmm. So it's it is constantly happening, and so we're really grateful for all of our partners that are that are working with us on that. And the global influenza surveillance and response system has been around for 70, 70 years. It's incredible. Uh, quietly, silently tracking these viruses, and uh, again, in terms of COVID, there's so much. And again, we we shouldn't we should celebrate sometimes how far we've come. Mm -hmm. With you know the genetic sequencing on this virus was done very quick, shared very quickly, but uh, we've we've had tremendous sharing of uh, genetic sequences around the world, allowing us to track how the virus is evolving and changing. That point that helps us track everything from how serious the virus is to make sure our diagnostics still work, to developing therapies, so many other things, developing vaccines and other, and other things. Uh, and there are a lot of um, uh, platforms that do that work, sequencing, and they, they put the sequences up on, on online that everyone can see them, and it's open for everyone to participate. Our, our colleagues in the, one of those platforms, GISAID, yep. uh, just uh, reached their 100,000 100, sequences published uh, so congratulations to Peter Bogner and all the people at GISAID. And that's done almost as an NGO service. There's not-for-profit. They're doing that work. It, they, they do it on a wing and a prayer sometimes. Uh, and they're kind. there are other Gene Bank and many other platforms that do this. And this is not WHO. These are collaborations between labs. They're non-governmental entities, governmental entities. And what they do is they allow us to share knowledge. Uh, and, yes. and right now, genetic sequencing is knowledge. It allows us to understand these viruses, their structures, how they invade cells, and allows us to develop uh, molecules to treat and vaccines to prevent. So, you know, we are, um, I suppose, uh, leveraging that fourth industrial revolution. It's not all bad. Technology and data are very important parts of this response. Uh, and, uh, you know, while we are all struggling with this, there is a prospect that a virus will have emerged on this planet a deadly virus. We will have detected it, characterized it, sequenced it, studied it, understood it, uh, controlled it, and developed an effective vaccine, all potentially between a year to 18 months. That's never, ever happened in history. Most diseases that have emerged in humankind have stuck around for centuries and killed millions, billions of people, like smallpox, like polio, like measles. So while we have a terrible tragedy in terms of the people we are losing, we are also, as a global community getting better at understanding and reacting uh, but we need to get much better because in this response you know we've lost too many of our older population the disease has spread too easily when we could be doing better at uh, stopping it uh, and we are as I said developing these vaccines as quickly as is possible but as safely as is needed and this is very very important the timing of uh, vaccine delivery to people we are going to ensure that vaccines that emerge uh, are going to be fully safe and fully efficacious before they're offered to humans uh, and WHO has a whole set of regulatory mechanisms in place to ensure that and advise governments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And besides vaccines, therapeutics that the scientists are working on, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work uh, done on diagnostics mm -hmm. that are very important to identify where the virus is and whether people are having COVID or flu. So can we reflect a little bit on tests? Uh, a few days ago, we also um, published um, updated guidance on rapid testing. So what are the rapid tests and how best can we use them? So there's different tests that are available to help us understand who is infected mm -hmm. with this virus actively, you know, or who has been infected with this virus. So we think about if we try to find active cases, people that are potentially infectious to others and they're dealing with it right now, we have two types of tests that we, what we mainly focus on. One are these PCR tests that are widely available. Um, and as Mike had mentioned with the sequences, the sequence was available you know, the first week of January. The first PCR assay was published on WHO website through partners from Germany the 13th of January, and that, that led to the rapid development of these PCR tests. Those are widely used. Um, we also have these, and that detects the fragments, RNA fragments, parts of the virus there. We also have these things, these tests called antigen-based rapid diagnostic tests. And that detects the SARS-CoV-2 proteins that the virus produces. And these are called rapid diagnostic tests because they can be done rapidly. Mm -hmm. And you can get a result 
back. What does it mean rapidly? Well, they, we're talking, um, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. I mean, very quickly. Very quickly. PCR can be very quick, too. Mm -hmm. um, let me remind everybody that PCR testing can actually be provided, results can be provided back in hours. It just depends on the collection of the sample, getting the sample to the right lab, running the PCR test, getting the result back to the individual. But if systems are in place, that can happen very quickly. These rapid antigen-based rapid tests are, can be done in, in minutes to hours, and, and they're much easier to use. Now, there's hundreds of these on the market. Um, what we're trying to do, and we're working with our partners um, at some coronavirus labs, we're working with FIND to evaluate these. Because even though they're on the market and they claim that they work great, they don't all work they don't all perform the same. And the issue with the antigen-based test is that they really work, they perform better when there's a lot of virus around in the community, and they perform better when you yourself have more virus in you, you know, when you when you have higher viral loads is what we say. So we, um, and, that's, and that really means minus two days before symptom onset up to the first five, seven days of your illness. It's when people tend to have the highest viral loads. Um, so what we've recently issued is how these can be used, how these can be rolled out. So we do have the PCR tests that are available, but in these antigen-based tests, they could be incredibly helpful in four different situations. The first is, and I'm looking at my notes because I need them, the first is to respond to suspect case, suspect outbreaks, you know, where you think there's an outbreak and you have no access to, to PCR tests. So these could be in remote settings, they can be in particular institutions, they could be in some semi-closed uh, communities, that's number one. The second one is to support outbreak investigations where you know you have a case, whether that was detected from PCR testing. And this can really help you do an expanded testing of your, your active case finding. You can look at your contacts, including asymptomatic contacts. You can do more testing in those outbreak situations. And that really helps with these cluster investigations, these outbreak investigations, which are happening in, in lots of different places. The third is to look at specific trends in some very key groups. So um, essential workers, frontline workers, people who are more exposed. And then the fourth is in areas where you have widespread community transmission. Like I said, if there's more virus around and there is the potential for more people to be infected, then they work better. And the reason I say they work better is because when you test somebody and somebody comes back with a positive test, you really want to know, is that a true positive or not? And so for PCR, we're more confident in those results right now um, compared to the antigen-based RDTs. But these are improving all the time. And this is a really, really positive thing. I just want us to be a little measured in how they're used because there could be certain situations where you can have a false positive or a false negative. And systematically, some of the RDTs or the antigen-based test RDTs tend to miss people earlier in their transmission cycle and people later. It tends to be good at picking up people when they have the highest loads of virus, yeah. and that's usually a much smaller period of time. Yeah. So you might miss people early, and you might miss people later in the course of the disease. Uh, it, uh, and there are, you know, there are, and the, it gets very technical around how predictive these tests are. In other words, I get a test. How sure am I, if, if you come and tell me my test is positive, how sure am I that that's really a positive test? Because it's going to affect my life. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to have to isolate. My family is going to have to quarantine my friends. I've got to tell everyone at work I'm going to be out of work for 14 days. I'm going to be worried like hell. <laughs> you know, all of those things. So this is not a zero-sum thing, you know. Um, and these tests perform, even though the tests and the manufacturers make good tests. It's not that we have some very good tests. The problem is it's the nature of the virus at the community level that determines how predictive a result is. And that's sometimes nothing much to do with the test. I'll just to give you an example. If uh, yeah, Liverpool are the champions in football in, 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 in the UK of the Premier League, right? If I'd ask you, what is the chance that a red shirt is a Liverpool shirt? And you'll say, well, what do you mean? Well, I say, if I look at red shirts in Liverpool on the day Liverpool are playing a game, it's very likely that someone wearing a red shirt is from Liverpool and maybe going to the game. If I do the same in London, that may not be the case. So where we do the test and how many others are around doing the same thing very often determines how predictive the result of that test is. And I know it sounds very technical, and I'm not trying to confuse people, but what Maria says is very important. The performance of the test 
is not necessarily technically how good the test is. It also depends on how rare or how frequent the disease is in the community. So these rapid tests tend to perform better when there's a lot of virus around and a lot of cases around. They don't perform so well when there's a very low incidence of cases. And in situations where there's a very low number of cases, we believe you're better to still use PCR-based testing when you're doing your case finding and contact tracing and get those results. And that's the thing. 90% of the time in the testing cycle is nothing to do with the test. It's all the logistics and the movement. So we can, we can make that better. Uh, so we need to take the inefficiencies out of the testing system and then add in antigen-based testing where it makes the system more effective, uh, more efficient, more productive. And I think that can be done. But antigen testing is not just a direct replacement for PCR-based testing. And we shouldn't think of it like that. It will supplement and it will help, but it will help a lot. And we have systems in place that do evaluate these you know, and look at them and through these emergency use and pre-qualification. And so there are processes that are there. That and, and our goal is to help countries and users say these ones perform better. In my situation, this is the type of strategy that we have. These are the types that we want to use. Um, and, and this is a positive. I think it may be a little complicated at first how they get rolled out, but countries are using them. And so we're trying to provide guidance on where they perform better so that it can alleviate some of the pressure on the PCR in some other locations. And, and it's a work in progress. But it's a very positive uh, advancement. And this is, this is, you know, so much technology is changing. And again, nine months in, we have... PCR tests, we have antigen-based tests. The third type of test, which you, we, we're, we talk about, are serologic tests. And these measure, measure antibody levels in an individual. And this will tell us if somebody has been infected sometime in the past. Those are more done for research studies, mm -hmm. um, not, not to decide you know, if they need clinical care or not, because it's measuring your infection from the past. Um, but that's another test that's out there as well. So. And uh, we're, yes, we're, <laughs> we're going to do one as well. Switzerland Swiss is doing its own study of because frontline workers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we've really got to go and stick our arms out as well. So right. we're, we're in this with you. We're in this with you. <laughs> we tested too. Uh, but yes, no, so these are, these are really positive things and they're helping us. And the sero, sero, excuse me, serology tests will give us an indication of how much of the population has been infected. And, and there are literally hundreds of these all over the place. You, I, if anyone has watched the pressers, I probably mention this every single time there's a press conference because this is really incredible nine months in. We have fought so hard to have this done for influenza, for MERS, um, you know, for Zika. You know, we, we try to get these studies done to really understand you know, how many people have been infected so far. And the serology tests tell us, I'm overgeneralizing, but of the hundreds of studies that have are, are being done and, and of the results we have, that less than 10% of the population globally you know, has been infected so far. That means the virus has a long way to go, which is why we keep talking about all of the measures that are put in place. Those seroprevalence levels are higher among different populations like frontline workers, health wor healthcare workers, essential workers, and there are some specific populations, you know, there's some examples in India um, where they have higher seroprevalence um, but it, we're nowhere near what this, you know, this level of herd immunity that we talk about when we think of vaccines, not, not natural herd immunity. Um, and so the virus has a long way to go. But we have these tests that are helping us. And they're really, and we're so grateful for all of the studies that are being done to, to really guide us as, as this pandemic evolves. A lot of questions have uh, arrived about serological tests. Um, what do we know from these studies um, about immunity? Uh, after people being infected, and also there are a lot of questions coming, is um, reinfection possible? Yes, so with these, so we're learning a lot about the course of infection that somebody has. So what norm typically happens is when somebody is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, their body will develop what we call these antibodies. And it takes a week or two or sometimes longer to develop these antibody levels. They, they, they develop over time. They increase over time. And these, these tests will measure that. Um, what we don't have a clear picture of yet is based on the type of disease that you have, whether you have asymptomatic infection all the way through severe disease, how quickly and how strong is that antibody response? Does that mean that you are immune from reinfection? And how long that will last? What we're seeing from the studies that are available, that are following individuals over time, the same individual over time, is that we are seeing people develop a robust immune response. 
which is strong, a strong immune response. And we do see this for people with severe disease, through mild disease, and even people who've had asymptomatic infection. Um, I'm generalizing here, but we are when we follow those individuals over time, that immune response tends to last. And we're, we, I mean, we've only followed people for a few months, so we don't know how long that will be. But that's a good indication, and that's a good indication that you know people will be protected for some time. We don't know how long that's going to last, though. We have examples with the human corona, other four human coronaviruses, with the SARS-CoV-1 virus and the MERS-CoV-1 virus, which means it's not a lifelong immunity. Um, and so those immunity levels will decline, or the antibody levels will decline over time, but we don't know how long that will be. There are a couple of examples of reinfection that we are aware of. Um, there's one from Hong Kong, there's one from the US, there are a few from the Netherlands, there's one from Belgium. Um, and these are case reports. So out of 28 million t confirmed cases so far, um, we do have examples where it seems like somebody has been reinfected. Um, and this has been detected through sequencing that we mentioned about previously. We, th this individual or these individuals had a sequence from the first infection and the second infection. So we know that it's possible. It tells us that it's possible. We don't know how much this is happening on a population level, um, and that's something that, that we are looking into, but we do have examples. Um, but people shouldn't be afraid, you know. Uh, we do have measures in place that, you know, you can protect yourself from infection, uh, from infection, and all of those measures, you know, still hold, um, but it does tell us it's possible. But for the majority of people, from the studies that we are seeing, people develop an immune response, and it seems to, it seems to last um, from the, the follow-up that we've seen. And I, I, I think yeah, it's important to, to emphasize that is, you know, we've had 28 million confirmed infections around the world. God knows how many more, but 28 million confirmed uh, infections, and you know, and, and of them, maybe 20 percent of people have been to, to hospital at one level or another. And what we're not seeing is lines of people who've been in hospital three or four months later coming back to hospital. Now, it's not to say that reinfection is not. Uh, doesn't happen. It clearly can happen. It happens with all infectious diseases. This is not unusual for COVID. Uh, but what we're not seeing thus far is a failure in your immune system uh, for, for very many people. It can happen. Uh, and over time, the levels of protection may drop. We also have to look at what we're protecting from. Sometimes an infection prevents you from having another infection. Sometimes having an infection doesn't prevent you from having another infection, but that infection may be much milder. Uh, and you, your immune system is conditioned a little, reacts more quickly, uh, and you can clear the infection more quickly. So in that sense, uh, uh, we're not just looking at risk of reinfection, but how severe would a second infection be? Uh, and and we're not, we need to track that. Uh, we need to track that as well. So uh, I, I do think it's important that we be very balanced in our in our view on this. And it will be the same when it comes to vaccines. Vaccines may protect for one year, that we need to people may need to take a booster dose, that may have to happen. But let's as I say, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. What we do know for now is that people who recover from an infection um, uh, have a protective level of immunity for a period of time. We believe that time is from months up to years. We don't know exactly how long that uh, lasts for, uh, and we still need to see whether, even at a long range, even if you can be reinfected, that you may actually be protected from the worst clinical aspects of the disease. So uh, a lot to learn still. We keep saying that, don't we? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I want to thank you very much. I know we are running out of time. This was a Great session with a lot of um, explanation what we know and how we can stop this virus. The last comment I want to pass to you is you invited our viewers as well to share their solutions and how our recommendations can be applied in local communities. So some of our viewers are what are the mechanisms that they are using some of our guidances and they know how to, to help the response, but they are looking what is the mechanism that they can share their experience and contribution with us. I think you definitely they can contact us through through digital platforms and social media, but is there any other mechanism that you would suggest as well for people to 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 get in touch with their solutions? Well I think there's a number of ways. Number one, uh, at community level, mm. your ideas really matter because you know the local situation, and I would love to see particularly young people becoming active really getting out there and activating their energy, their minds, to support local responses. Uh, and then to hold everyone else to account. Mm -hmm. it, it is time. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, you know, as I've said here before, planet planet's yours or it will be yours you you're inheriting it so you better make sure we leave it to you in some kind of uh, good order so uh, i do uh, i i think there is a way it, you know uh, organize and activate yourselves become activists for this for climate for whatever you choose uh but also in terms of getting to us we'd be very happy certainly with youth and uh groups to and i know you've had these i i would love to have some more seminars or more interactive sessions two-way Zoom calls. We do this all the time. Yeah, we do. Uh, I, we but do say, this. probably looking at boring old farts like myself. So it's maybe we need to create a forum where we can have a maybe a youth council where we can, you know, we have a World Health Assembly coming up we do. Uh, soon uh, of the ministers. Maybe we could have a, a World Youth Assembly on this, and maybe we need a summit of the young to sort out what you want from from this response and what kind of a planet you want to inherit. So. Maybe we'll talk to Dr. Terrace. He's he's the man. He loves crazy he ideas. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a chat with him and see if we can have some create something maybe a bit more dynamic. Uh, dynamic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We reach out with a lot of youth groups as well, just to say on some of our webinars. And and I agree, we should be a little. We could be more creative in this. And again, come to us with some ideas. But you know, get active in your schools. Mm -hmm. Get active in your universities. Active in your churches. Um, you know. Where you interact in your communities, offer these, raise your voice, you know, use your voice, raise your voice, you matter. Your voice matters. We care about you and your families, and so this is why we're so passionate about the things that we say and how we can fight this together. But I do think the social media platform can be really um, beneficial, um, especially with, you know, we need to flood the system with positive stories. There's a lot of information that's out there that's very negative. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard, and, and people are going through something very difficult, and this is really difficult. So if you have some positive stories to share, please do so. Tag us in them and, and show us some positive stories about how you are making an impact. I would love to see that. Um, I know all of us would love to see these things. And by doing so, you're sharing your story with so many other people. So let's use the technology that we have. Mm -hmm. Thank can, you very much. Can oh, I just please? say one thing? Yes. Because I hear this word influencer all the time. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, in some senses, a deference. And it's important. There are people who influence in every society, in, all the way through history. So we talk about media influencers or social media influencers, important people in our society right now. But everybody's an influencer. Exactly. Don't give up your right to act. Don't give up your capacity to act. And don't give up your right to have an idea and share it to an influencer. Uh, you are the influencers, influence the influencers. Uh, yes, we do need people who bring those ideas together and we thank them for the work they do in getting the right information out there. But uh, we need everyone to be an influencer now because in the end of the day, this virus affects houses, households and streets. Who are the influencers there? Who are the influencers in the school? Who are the influencers in the bar when people are too close together? Who are the influences on the bus when people get on and aren't wearing masks? That's where you influence. That's where you act. Uh, so yes, let's have a big discussion, but let's act too. Let's act. Let's take action uh, to make this better. And who better than, than particularly our youth? Uh, every single person watching us right now. Mm -hmm. So we, you call us to work harder. We call you to work harder. We all are in this together. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll work harder. We, we will definitely <laughs> work harder. We will definitely work harder. But yeah. Thanks, Alex. For and thank you very much, to both of you. I thank all our viewers uh, for watching us, for sending your questions. Uh, please join us next Wednesday again. And as Mike just said, let's all be influencers. This is our planet, and this is the outbreak we all need to take part in. Response we need, we all need to take part in. Until next Wednesday, please follow our advice, follow public health measures, and stay safe.